How's everybody doing today? Awesome. Good. Who's hungover? No. Joy? Yeah. No. Oh, okay. <laughs> I am. But. Um, okay. So I uh, just wanted to welcome you to the panel here. Uh, how I got into <coughs> science. Um, and we have the uh, collection plate here for uh, helping, what is it, helping hands? Yes, helping hands. Uh, so if you want to donate to the charity, please feel free to do so. Uh, I am going to go ahead and hand this over to Rochelle Brooks. Good morning. You'll notice I just took off my mask. Uh, the, the speakers will do this. We'd ask the audience members to keep their mask on. This is for accessibility. We do have a request for lip reading. Um, so you'll see that the speakers will either take off or take down their mask while they're speaking and then probably put them on for certain portions. Um, so hopefully if you don't feel comfortable with that, perhaps step two, we have plenty of room for social distancing, um, but we are doing that to help with our lip reading folks in the audience. So I'm Rachel Burks. I am a chemist, so I like to blow things up, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> I like pretty colors. Uh, you know, and then more importantly, just staring at containers full of pretty <laughs> colors. Uh, and I am joined today by a great panel of people, and I am going to have them introduce themselves, just say their discipline and their name in reverse alphabetical order by discipline. Oh, come on. <laughs> You're picking on me now. <laughs> yes. Uh, all right. Being being the being the one that was always called last in school. I'm Trevor Valley, and I am a paleontologist. Or for the ah, there we go. Hi, I'm pa I'm Trevor Valley, and I am a paleontologist. <laughs> Does O come next or? S. Yeah, for your electrical engineering. Yeah. I was oh. going to say O for organic. Oh, okay. I like this. Okay. Wait, I, I thought it was last name. Oh, it's discipline. She said discipline. Oh. Well, okay, so oh, all right. how many professors are on the panel? <laughs> how many professors? Honest. Raise your hand if you're a professor on the panel. Real high. And how many people did just not listen to the directions <laughs> delivered to them? Okay. So what? Wait, wait. They were ambiguous. <laughs> <laughs> Alphabetical by... Di did, did you... I, I didn't hear the by discipline <laughs> part. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I hear reverse alphabetical, and all of a sudden, I go back to homeroom, going, "I'm gonna get called last." <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's just try the Tori. Just go, girl. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Tori Stenmark. I am an organic chemist and uh, adjunct faculty at Shoreline Community College near Seattle. I also like to blow stuff up and watch things turn pretty colors. And but all of my chemistry smells terrible. It's very sad. <laughs> Daniels Race, or as I wrote on there, my students call me Dr. Race. That's actually my last name, like running around. And I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at Louisiana State University. And as my, by the time I finished my PhD, I went from circuits to integrated circuits to what's inside them. So I do electronic materials and nanoscale, nanomaterials, nanoscience, nanotech, whatever you like to call it. Cool. Uh, hi, I'm Erin McDonald. I'm an astrophysicist by trade. I did research and uh, adjunct professorships for a while, then went into aerospace engineering and now work as a science advisor in the entertainment industry. Hi. Can, can I change my answer to, hi, I'm Trevor, I'm woefully unqualified for this panel? <laughs> <laughs> Holy no. shit. Uh, <laughs> so this is how we all got into science, or like I like to call it our villain origin story. <laughs> And, or that's, I've just outed myself. Uh, but let's see, how do I want to do this? Uh, first, let's go with what was, just just quick, what was the age, right, that you thought, hey, maybe science? <laughs> not totally committed, because honestly, I'm 47, not quite oh sure. Gosh, <laughs> honestly, <laughs> it's, thank you, I'm aging very well. Uh, <laughs> oh my no. gosh. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Um, for me, it was 10. I, wow. Yeah, I would say because, um, and I know this because it's the 25th anniversary of the film Contact. It just came out. Nice. Okay. And that okay. is when I was like, oh, 
that would yeah because I saw I mean I was also watching the X Files yeah in yeah, secret yeah. I was not old enough to watch. I was officially <laughs> not old enough to watch the X I'm mad at my ten year old self for <laughs> sneaking to watch the X Files but um, but yeah contact seeing Dr Ellie Airway operate the radio telescopes and just be awesome in her own right made you know some questionable romantic decisions but haven't we all <laughs> <laughs> she was a whole character and that's what yeah it was really cool so cool, I would say that, yeah that really awesome. embedded itself in my mind okay this is the honest to god's truth between four and five um, wow. and the reason why is i i love when my mom's elementary school teacher 42 years new orleans public school wow. system no air conditioning that whole time thank she's her. a saint thank her. Yes. Oof. Yesterday was her birthday. Oh, uh, that was, oh. I can't say her age. Well. She'll jump out of the wall and hit me. <laughs> so let's just say she's an octogenarian. All right. Okay. And then my dad's a nonogenarian. I think it's a to- term. Um, he also was a high school math teacher, 42 years as well, um, and then guidance counselor. So anyway, when I was five and getting ready for school, for you know kindergarten, it's, it's absolutely true. Just before that, when I was four, my mom brought home this set of books. Like you know, elementary school teachers have all these books and. Each book was a different subject. Like it was nature and poetry and blah, blah, blah. And there was one that said science. And I still have it in my closet, duct taped together. And they had all these little simple experiments. And I, it's going to sound really dated when I talk about things like pinwheels and milk bottles, but that was part of the you know, things in there. And I just loved it. And when I got five, I asked my dad, how long do you go to school? I, he was in the room while I'm getting ready. And I didn't mean like for the day. I meant like, what, like, what am I in for? You know, like what, what's, <laughs> seriously. And so he, he said, just really nonchalantly, he said, well, you go to elementary school, you go to high school, you go to college. And he said, and then some people get what's called a master's or a PhD. And I said, what's a PhD? And all I remember, he did not say you should get a PhD. He just said, well, you know, people, you know, they have doctor in front of their names. So, and I thought, and this is honestly, this is true, I thought, okay, I, I know Dr. Einstein, I know about Dr. Frankenstein from the cartoon. <laughs> yeah. And they're scientists. All right, I'll get a doctorate. I'll get a P- and that was it. That was it. That is like the smartest four or five year old I've no. ever heard of. Honestly. And, and I briefly thought of getting an MBA, because where I did my master's, all the professors who had Porsche and stuff, had some companies on the side, but my dear husband was like, no, you always want a PhD, go get it. My sister got the MBA. So. But, I, I, isn't the bullshit of the ivory tower a later panel? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we and piled higher and deeper. Oh, yeah. yeah. So Trevor, what about you? Oh, okay, I have a, um, I have a question um, for the moderator. Uh-oh. <laughs> what time? What science specifically? No, just what any science doesn't have to even be the one that you're doing now. One one that you're like, oh, this this is a possibility. Oh, cool. April twelfth, nineteen eighty one. Hi. Look at the per- Columbia. At yeah. That. <laughs> First flight, STS one of Columbia. Ah, okay. My mom kept me home to watch something called a space shuttle launch. Nice. And at that point, I'm like, I want to fly that thing into space. <laughs> Naturally, that did not happen. <laughs> so for paleontology, it was 2007. That is so awesome. The other direction. I'm, I, I've been... I've, well, so it was... First it was uh, April 12th, 1981, and then after a thing in college, it was like, maybe I'll go into anatomy and be a doctor. And then that kind of went by the wayside, and then it turned into paleontology in 2000. Technically, 2008. Yeah. I love I'm, the journey. I'm, I'm on plan C through Z at this point. <laughs> I love it. Tori. Uh, let's see. When I was in first grade, my science fair project, or it was like some sort of presentation we had to do for the class, and mine was about how I was going to be a scientist when I grew up. Um, so six-ish, because I knew before that I started that. So somewhere around the age of six, I was like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a scientist. Um, and I found chemistry when I fell in love with my, uh, I was in an organic chemistry lecture, um, and I was sitting there watching, watching her lecture going, like she's putting up this, this complicated synthesis, and I went, I want to do that for the rest of my life. And I for thought, six? No. Oh. I was in college. I'm like, wait, oh. when were yeah, you in like the chemistry <laughs> lecture? We jumped ahead like 15 years? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, I had a, but it was a good story, because I saw her, like, I want to do that. And I thought I meant research, and what I meant I wanted to do was to teach. So. Oh, awesome. 
Yeah, I thought you were six going, I want to break hydrocarbon chains for life. (laughs) I mean, as you do. Does Uh, every six-year-old want that? Come on. So we've got a big, we've got a fairly big range and some changes. I would say for myself, when I was four or five, um, I wanted to be a lawyer because I like to argue (laughs) and I like to wear suits. Um, That has changed. I can't remember the last time I was in a suit, a funeral. I honestly, I don't know. Uh, but I think for to get into more into science is it was junior high to a trip to DC and we got to kind of tour which is not even open now it's a uh, FBI did a little presentation on forensic science and that kind of got me into before that and I'm also in the shuttle era I was that like kid in the back who's like why are we spending all this money to go to space we have like oh. real problems at home I was a delight <laughs> <laughs> I didn't understand it right I didn't understand why we were doing it um, that came much later to, to understand the scope and the magnitude of what we were doing uh, and so it was it too I just I honestly did not see the point and I'll out myself up until junior high I was like what are we doing science for for it does nothing for us (laughs) and I don't know how I missed that up until then but that for some reason that trip like I was like oh this this is how we this is how we do everything oh wow (laughs) and so then I I feel like I'm late to the party of realizing like oh wow okay so this is why everything works no there are still people that think that (laughs) so yeah Mm. yes so now I want to hear a little bit deeper about some more details and I'm gonna the winner of this part who gets to go first is the person who clearly was the youngest and most together which is our (laughs) engineer (laughs) four and five who really had the scheme going (laughs) so why why electrical engineering I can answer that as well Um, when I was in high school about that time my dad had switched from uh, high school math teacher to guidance counselor he got a master's in uh, you know, guidance counseling. And one day in my room, he walked by and he threw this pamphlet on the bed. And the pamphlet actually said, Women in Engineering. And uh, progressive dad, right? <laughs> and so I opened it up and I thought, oh, okay, well, it's got science and it's more applied science, which at the time I was into. Now, I apologize if you heard me say this before of any other panel, but as my friends say, you're really a physicist, join us, resistance is futile, <laughs> come on, you know, because the work that I do, and, and I, so I say basically, I'm someone who approaches problems or thinks like a physicist, but the heart of a material scientist happily trapped in an EE's body. So, <laughs> so but when my dad threw this pamphlet on the bed, I was trying to decide, you know, some of y'all might have heard this when you came in between EE and, and chemi, chemical engineering. Mm-hmm. I also am one of these, I like to have a plan B, and I, I found a kind of, well, I guess maybe high school, getting into college, that the summer jobs and internships were at that time, I got, and I'm older than anybody on the planet, but were much more available if you were an engineering major than if you were basic sciences. So, but by the time I got to college freshman year, ending, you know, um, I went to Rice and uh, essentially Rice was like, oh, you thought you were smart when you got here, didn't you? <laughs> bang, 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 you know? I mean, it was like, kept, we took what was called the big Who three. else has had that experience of being like, yeah, uh, uh, calculus, yeah, chemistry, yeah. physics. You <laughs> yeah. took them both semesters. Yeah. All the so the bottom line is, I opened up the chemistry book. That at the end of freshman year, at the back of the book, they had like a little bit of organic chemistry, and this, this caption read like, "This is the boat figure," and I'm going, what? <laughs> and "This is the chair figure." I was, and you know those little I call it chicken wire. No offense, yeah. wire again. No. I was like, I don't see a chair. Okay. Because I had done some <laughs> EE stuff, and that was it. That was it. I was like, now years later, I said, God's got a sense of humor. My, my research group, just real quick, is called Applied Hybrid Electronic Materials and Structures, or AHEMS. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and so hybrid materials can be organic and or inorganic. So I did yeah. sit in on an Argo class, and then, then it made sense. But I didn't She's trying to bring back a flashback. Here's okay. a chair. <laughs> This is this is what we organic yes, chemists call a chair. Look, look at that. Yeah. That's uh, a lightning yeah. bolt to me. Yeah. That looks like a lightning bolt. I always tell my students, I finished my furnished my first apartment from IKEA and I've never seen a chair that looks like this. Well, in, in the pop mar- modern era of interior design, that could yeah. It could be a chair. I think I've sat chair. in that chair yeah. at some point. <laughs> But I think it was in like a Picasso museum. It, or it's it's that it's you know it's a hard <laughs> angle chaise lounge. Yes. So. Torture device. 
So now, Trevor, since you made a career change, and so have I, and we've all kind yeah. of morphed at different times, what what was it about paleontology? Because <laughs> you were, okay, you went from space Okay, to so um, it, it's like you can do the clue thing, like long story too short, too late. Um, <laughs> but uh, long story short, everything lined up for space to the point where I am a four-time space camp alumni. Yes. Space Camp, Space Academy, Space Academy Level 2, and Aviation Challenge. Um, then a very large uh, branch of the military, which will remain nameless. Uh, there was a big screw up on that. And I'm like, great. What the fuck do I do now? <laughs> so I used, uh, I used the money earned from that and went to college, uh, Boston College to be specific, because I thought, I can help people. I want to be an ER doctor. Um, and in pre-med, they told me I had zero bedside manner during the ethics panel. <laughs> and I told them, I want to be a trauma doc. Why do I even have to care? It's like, this is a gunshot wound. Let's do this. And they're like, yeah, maybe you should do something else. So then I went into biology because animals don't talk back. <laughs> Right. Um, I received uh, dual masters in uh, in terrestrial biology, focusing on herpetology, and one on uh, marine biology, focusing on saltwater crocodiles. So then I naturally worked in an aquarium, the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, and they had an ex they had an exhibit there called uh, Dazzling and Dangerous with reptiles from the local Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. I got to uh, got to learn the uh, uh, like everybody cool at at Nat Hist and all of that, and then there was a falling out with the aquarium because they were removing uh, they were removing animal exhibits for a, an exhibit called Surf and Surf Culture. Um, there is that I will not confirm nor deny there was an incident in the boardroom and, uh, <laughs> by one of the husbandry staff, <clears throat> um, and then as I'm driving home. I'm on my motorcycle going from Long Beach to the San Fernando Valley. My phone rings. I pull over, and it is the manager of the Living Collections Department of Natural History going, hey, if you ever want to change jobs, I'm like, I just resigned. I'll be there in 30 minutes. Very fast Ducati ride later. I'm walking into the Natural History Museum in full leathers, helmet, going, hi, where's Leslie Gordon? And yeah, I joined the uh, Natural History Museum in 2007, and while I was doing education in live animals, uh, because of my, uh, I also have an osteology background because of biology, the Dinosaur Institute went, hey, do you want to like just clean fossils part-time for fun? Sure. A year later, I'm told that I'm being made the assistant lab supervisor of the La Brea Tar Pits. Best and then the best tar pits, <laughs> and then every and then like uh, what is it in Fight Club? It's like and then the world stops and yeah, and now I'm here as a career paleontologist for the last twenty years. That's awesome. So lots yeah, of twists. Yeah, it's weird. And that's taken me everywhere from the fabulous areas such as. Well, uh, large construction projects in downtown LA to Siberia. Wow. Yeah, a lot of fun. And awesome. I'm still not quite sure why I'm doing it. <laughs> <laughs> every day, every day, sometimes yeah. twice a day. Yeah, I asked myself. Twice. That. So, Tori, you also had a change, right? You also kind of transitioned into what you thought. What? Tell us more about that. Yeah, so. Um, I, you know, have, have been into chemistry and biochemistry. You know, I had a biochem undergrad major, the major of the future, we called it, mm -hmm. um, and did uh, chem research and, and came to the University of Washington intending to get my PhD in chemistry. And grad school sucks. If you are interested in grad school, I'm happy to have an open and honest conversation with you about it. I don't want to discourage you, but I want you to know that it sucks. Sucks. And it kind of, it ground me down in a lot of ways. And um, I ended up realizing that the, the and part of it's my advisor and whatever, and it's a whole thing. Um, and so I ended up getting my master's degree, which is the consolation prize in the hard sciences. When you go to grad school, you go to grad school for the PhD, and it is the oh, consolation right. prize. <laughs> Yeah, I, anyway, um, I have a lot of, I, I apparently missed the BS in the Ivory Tower panel, so we're going to set some of that aside. Um, and I ended up 
uh, you know, looking for, I ended up realizing that I, I was enjoying the teaching aspects of grad school. It was just some of the other institutional stuff and some of the lack of support from my advisor. Um, and so I, and you, you TA your way through grad school, at least I did, because I had a new PI with no money. Um, and I was like, okay, but the teaching part is actually kind of, and so I said it to myself, all right, I'm going to go, you know, teach at a local community college for like a year or so, and then I'm going to reevaluate. And if I want to go finish my PhD somewhere else, I have options. Uh, 13 years later, I'm still at Shoreline Community College. Um, uh, still, sorry, I, we're, we're, we're setting aside the bitterness and the nonsense. Uh, I, do, I teach <laughs> adjunct, which is associated fact that's part-time, part-time they call it, uh, which is to say on a contingent basis. Uh, but I love teaching and it's, it's come out sort of as I said, I thought what I wanted to do was to research. I thought I was gonna go work for big pharma and, and make drugs, which would be you know cool and fun and worthwhile. Um, and it turns out that what I, what I do is teach, and that's how I change the world, is, is launching these kids on incredible journeys, so. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I would have been a good advisor for you. I would have been a nice advisor. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean, though. <laughs> now, you talk about launching. <laughs> you can tell how much I don't know about anything Astro. I'm like, launching. <laughs> space. 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 Yeah. I mean, Final it's funny because I, I said, you know, I mentioned contact and I have a PhD in astrophysics and that seems like a pretty straightforward line, but it really wasn't. I, um, I think a lot of kids love space, love space and dinosaurs. That's where the jam is at. Mm. <laughs> oh, yeah. I didn't like dinosaurs. <laughs> I loved you- space and dinosaurs. And, um, and mummies. And so I, yeah, I just knew I wanted to be a scientist. I think that was really the only thing. And I kind of meandered and found my way. Like, I did things like the Science Olympiad when I was in school, and I did kind of those after-school projects. Um, but again, my obsession with Dana Scully continued to increase. And I've kind of, I've not really gone a lot into this, but because because this, this is what this panel is about. Um, I was taking biology, and I, I enjoyed it, but I wasn't very good at it. Squishy things in me are not great. And <laughs> talked about like enjoying blowing things up. I accidentally like blew a lot of stuff up, and like I was not good in chemistry. Precision was not my jam. Um, and uh, and so I was also a dancer as well. And so I was in the dance I was taking dance at school was on the dance team and they hired a new teacher and her and I did not get along um and so I was looking for other options and they said well you could take physics you know you're already taking biology but you could take physics this is in high school um and the physics teacher was kind of (laughs) cute so I was like all right I'll take physics (laughs) I'll take physics sure um and honestly like that's when I took physics, I, I didn't even like know what physics was at that age. You know, you don't you learn gravity and you learn those things, but you're learning that in a combined science thing. And mm-hmm. so you're not really realizing that physics is its own field. And then once I realized that like I could go to college and just study space and and do that through physics, that blew my mind. It's like once we started learning about the motion of the planets and like how stars worked and all of that, that's when I was like, this is really cool. Like, this is where it clicked. So I went to, um, I actually went to a different university for my freshman year. Um, it didn't work. This is something I always try to convey to people. Like, you're never locked in. <laughs> you know, yeah. you yeah. can change. And so I transferred because I grew up in Colorado, and I had a professor at my old university who was like, you get in-state tuition in Colorado, and you want to do astrophysics? Like, you need to go back, and you need to go to Boulder, because that's one of the best colleges but all I knew is that half my high school went to CU Boulder and it was all like some frat party school I was like I don't want to go there um but I went and he was right it was a huge they had tons of opportunities for undergraduates to do research and that's when I learned like I I was not I'm like a B student in the classroom but research was something I really connected with and something I enjoyed so I did radio astronomy. That was where I got my Dr. Ellie Arroway moment. <laughs> I got to do radio astronomy as an undergrad, you know, so I'm crunching numbers and doing data for a young professor. Um, and then when I was looking for graduate schools, it wasn't, none of this was ever to become a professor, to become a career researcher. I just liked it and I wanted to keep doing it. And so I looked for PhD programs And at the University of Glasgow in Scotland, I didn't have time to um, study abroad, but it was something I always wanted to do. And their programs were much better suited to me because I now had three years of research under my belt. So I knew kind of how to do research and what I was interested in. And um, long story not short. (laughs) Too uh, late. um, 
the uh, professor, like I reached out to over there, because you need to have a professor sponsor your applications yep. in the UK, and I think most other places as well. I reached out to him because he did radio astronomy at the University of Glasgow, and he wrote back and said, actually, like, I have pivoted, and they haven't updated the website, which for anyone who works at a university is, like, really, <laughs> really familiar. <laughs> um, but he said, I'm actually working for this group called LIGO, and we're studying gravitational waves, and I'm trying to analyze uh, gravitational waves from neutron stars. So I studied neutron stars as a radio astronomer. Now I'm trying to find gravitational waves from them. Would love to have you apply as a PhD student. And so I transitioned into gravitational waves, and that was, I really enjoyed that. I also did a dual major in mathematics, so I really like the math play aspect of astrophysics. So I did a lot of theoretical um, sort of predictions for what signals would look like coming from gamma ray bursts and from slightly asymmetric neutron stars. So it was like this weird wandering path that I took. And uh, yeah, I mean, ultimately, I, I just loved studying space. And then there's like a whole journey after that, too. <laughs> so that's how I ended up in astrophysics. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, yeah, we have, we have, there's twists and turns at various, I think, various points. For me, once I realized, I'm like, so like science, like super important, cool. <laughs> uh, but kind of found that, you know, wanting to be a lawyer, and of course, if you think science, it's forensic science is a good fit for that. Um, but there's so many disciplines, and I realized the discipline that really interested me was, what the hell is that? <laughs> <laughs> that is, how do, how do we figure out what that thing is? It's a white crystal and solid. Um, or green brown plant material. <laughs> uh, what is it? And that was uh, to me, it was introduced as being you know analytical chemistry, and and also being able to design instruments and build ones. And what I liked about it, my experience was, is like we're like the MacGyvers of chemistry. It's like what's the budget? What do we have available? Okay, give me a, a recycled cardboard box, that that black electrical tape, and yeah, hand me that tissue paper. We can make something work. Okay. <laughs> And so kind of got, got into that. And I did not go to grad school thinking I would be a professor. I went because if you have a PhD in chemistry at that time, um, you had the lowest unemployment rate. Oh. And I also wanted mobility in forensic science labs and to work at the federal level. The more degrees you have, the higher you go up in GS level. Right? So then I get my what I think is a dream job and realize I have zero time to do any research and development, even though I'm best suited to do that now because I know what the challenges are on the front line and what needs to be done. But the day I started, I was told I was already six months behind, (laughs) which I was like, that's offensive and how dare you. Uh, But you just never have any time. And then I realized I wanted to have that time to develop what I think are good tools. And so, and I also surprisingly really miss teaching and training students, and that is actually one of the funnest and most difficult parts of my job. Um, And so then trying to get back into academia when you don't do it in the right order can be fun. (laughs) 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 But that also goes in the bullshit in academia, but yeah, so now I am a professor and I get to, you know, hopefully support my students based on, let's let's not be as trash as our predecessors (laughs) sometimes were. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but yes, I spend a, a lot of sometimes. my time teaching, and sometimes I get to build cool stuff. Yeah, but yeah, and that's what I'm doing now. I I tell my students I don't know what I'm going to be doing in five and ten years, but it's fun for now. And I think a lot of our peers. So now, though, go back to Astro. Um, you've made other later stage quote later stage career changes what is your focus now yeah so I um so the sort of journey after my PhD was I sat down at my postdoc and as was mentioned grad school sucks (laughs) and (laughs) you burnt out and I'm like I hate everything about this and I don't want to do it and one of my my sort of support supervisor he was like look just just apply to postdocs and get away from your dissertation. <laughs> it's like, just take that space away from trying to do your finish your PhD, get the postdoc, because it's going to be really hard if you leave right after your PhD and then decide you want to come back and do a postdoc in our field. Because at that time, they hadn't detected gravitational waves, so jobs were not very <laughs> available. And so I did a post, I got a postdoc position at Cardiff University, and I sat down on my first day and just went, oh, no. <laughs> I don't want to do this for the rest of my, this is the rest of my life now. I don't like this. Um, 
but I loved teaching, as people on this panel have expressed as well. And another thing I loved was science communicating. I had the opportunity around that time to talk on like a web series video of the science behind Mass Effect, which is awesome, and we love Mass Effect. And, and I did this video, and it was so clear when it came out, and I was very excited. It got to be a talking head. I always wanted to do this stuff. Um, <laughs> that I had not spoken to a non-scientist stranger in like five years. <laughs> it was very evident. And so that kind of shocked, like it really shocked me. It was, it was a really kind of wake, a wake moment for me. So I ended up signing up for adult acting and improv classes just to have something to do, to have a hobby, really? to meet scientists. Mm -hmm. yeah. I never knew that. That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> and That's so, rad. <laughs> thank you. It was great. It was really, it was really healthy for me. It was good to get away from the department, but it also gave me that perspective of like some of the peers that I work with. The, this is their whole job, you know. Like I was in a play as part of this thing, and. Uh, a last minute conference came up in you know Spain that they needed me to go to and I'm like I can't I'm gonna play that weekend and they're like no but you like you have to go and I'm like but you're asking me to fly out on a Friday <laughs> for a meeting that starts on Sunday like no and they were like but surely you have an understudy and I'm like oh this is like community theater they don't have understudies <laughs> like, this is, and so that's kind of where just those clashes began um, so I left, but because I left academia, um, my visa was no longer valid because it was contingent upon my career. And so I moved back to the United States. I moved back to Colorado, and I started working as an adjunct professor at community college, which I loved. It was the community college system of, of Colorado. Um, did not pay the bills. Uh, so I also had a part-time job at the Denver Museum of Nature and, and Science, which was also great. So um, I, I, I grew up in Colorado, <laughs> and that... The Denver Museum of, I, I call it natural history because I'm old, but the Museum of Nature and Science was so formative for me. That's really cool to hear that you were it's there. It's a really, it's really so cool place to work. Yeah, and it was really, it was awesome. And because I come in and I'm like, hey, I have a PhD and you have a part-time performer position. Like, can I have that job? <laughs> and they were like, yes, go to the space area and don't leave. <laughs> like, all day, every day. And so that, I think, is where I honed a lot of my science communication skills yeah. was trying to find ways um, to communicate to a five-year-old who just learned about black holes and a retired aerospace engineer who wants to know about Mars missions and like all these other ways of just thinking on your feet and learning how to say no or to how to say I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Honestly. Panel brain. I skipped ahead. Can you sentence. tell me really about stars? Panel. We, no. That's a whole different panel. That's a different panel. Yeah. Um, Which is very important <laughs> and will be happening at 1230. So, no. um, I don't speak to anybody younger than six. <laughs> yeah, right. no. no, child, get away from me. Um, yeah, and I and then um, because it didn't, I mean, this broke my heart because I loved what I was doing, but I literally could not pay the bills. I was getting up at 430 in the morning to go work at Starbucks before my teaching shift, before the museum shift. Like, it was tough. Yeah. And so I started applying to aerospace engineering jobs, which is also really big in Colorado. Um, thankfully, someone actually read my poorly put together, no idea of an industry resume, <laughs> the best I could call it at the time. And the woman went, oh, this is a systems engineering degree. Like, this, that's what this woman does. Like, she's a systems engineer. It's just coded in theoretical astrophysics. <laughs> and so, so I got hired to do that, and I worked as a technical advisor for the federal government for about five years. So that took me to Los Angeles. And once I got out there, again, I missed teaching. I was doing things like Dragon Con. I was going to the, all these other conventions. And then I got on uh, the radar of a lot of writers and uh, other people in the industry who wanted me to come and help with stuff. Um, CBS heard about my Science of Star Trek talks. They asked me to come and give their talks at their official events. And then this was when the new Star Trek series were starting to come out. And when Michelle Paradise took over for season three of Star Trek Discovery, she was like, I'd really like to have a science consultant because that's the long history of Star Trek, has always done that. And they were like, well, we know an astrophysicist who's <laughs> been doing a lot of stuff for us. And so that's kind of how I got on that radar. That went well. I would say a lot of the improv, the, a lot of the teaching, all of that is what's fed into that success. And then they, they asked me to be the consultant like for the whole franchise. So, so that's oh, what that's I do now. Awesome. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> so, weird journey, yeah, but yeah. So Thede, you were talking about how you are, wait, let me think I remember this, a <laughs> physicist. With the heart of a material, material science. Trapped, trapped in an electrical engineer. Oh, right, yeah. okay. so. Later stage, but you start. When, when did you notice you're like, oh, I'm gonna have to make a shift? 
What, was there points oh. where you're like, oh, I need to make a turn here? It, it wasn't really a shift. Like the, the really only shift was um, between Kemi and E.E. E. Okay. And and um, like you know, I said I saw that pamphlet in high school that my dad <laughs> said take a look at this. And we ruined. We basically our boats and our chairs ruined one aspect of it. Right. <laughs> what, oh. What? Well, yeah, well, oh. Yeah. 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 Yeah, draw the boat. See, see, <laughs> see what. Um, anyway, no. So what happened for me? Uh, now everybody's saying that I. Are there any students in the room? Just care. No, mm -hmm. lifelong learners. Okay, mm -hmm. all right. I did not set out to be a professor. So one thing I will tell people is, if you're going to get There's a doctorate, it does not. See, that, see, look at that. That's now, a that's boat. Kind so of it's, boat. it's, it's boat. kind of boat-like. It's not quite. Technically, mm. it should be the kayak figure. Hold it next to the chair. Hold it next to the chair. Now, suppose they're like together. It'll, what the? That's a boat. <laughs> Look, I agree. It is. <laughs> it is not our the, the, finest hour. I will end, concede the point. <laughs> the end broke off the boat. Yeah. <laughs> I'm glad you did that because I like I now Canoe I know. Canoe Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I, I'm gonna have to teach this now. Next next time I'm in organic, I'm like, all right. So your textbook is gonna call this the boat. Sure, it's a canoe. We're gonna call it. This is the Titanic. <laughs> it's all yeah, my friend I Trevor's fault. Think of the deck. Chair. Chair. Uh, the there you go. Oh. Where were y'all? I, I might have to steal I, I that. I have the wrong <laughs> discipline. That's where I am. Oh, you, if you get a doctorate, now I know it's kind of field specific, but you do not have to be a, a professor. No. And in my case, not. when I was the last year of my PhD, and I was essentially like, okay, I, I want to get this done. My dear husband, now of 37 years, who's sitting right there, Aww. he was in residency. He's now a retired OBGYN who also got a law degree, believe it or not. Not because he I'm got tired. sued. Why? Nothing like that. <laughs> um, so we told our kids there's more degrees than the thermometer in this family. Somebody needs to make some money. So <laughs> yes. They are. Yes. Uh, they are. Our youngest is majoring in Mechie, and he's also started a business on the side. So we'll see. You know. Anyway, that being said, I, I looked at my last year of the doctorate, and I – a couple of things happened. I wanted to mo finish up about the time he finished up because we were married and we wanted to kind of, we, we didn't even live in the same city. We dated for about five years. We were in the same city for the first two, right? And then I went to get my master's on purpose. And, and I, I always tell my friends in science, it was not it was not because I flunked the PhD qualifier exam. I, that's what I had funding for. So yeah. I got, and I also wanted to find out more things before I really jumped into a more specific PhD programs. I got a master's on purpose. I had fellowships and college, if y'all know, no family's not rich. Mm -hmm. So, I, so he was finishing med school, um, and I went to to Stanford, and because I wanted to see Silicon Valley, and my fellowship would let you go there. And then we got married, not knowing where we were going to live, because you know, if you're a resident, if you're a med student, mm -hmm. you do match, as it's called, for residency. So people were like, "Oh, you're getting married, you know, May, and and uh, what, uh, where you're going to live?" Um, yeah. yeah. So, uh, and, and I have to give him great credit because he said to me, look, there are great residencies all over the country. I know you want to go to a top school. Where do you want to be? So I gave him a list of schools, and that's where he applied for residency. And so as it turned Aww. out, yeah. <laughs> Good partner. And so it has turned out the first school I heard from was Cornell. And we can definitely get into some of the, oh, uh, the, the – <coughs> Not, it's before 10, they, uh, we were told, BS. no bad, BS. BS. no ba bologna sausage. Yeah. Oh, yeah, or you have to put up, you have to put something in the swear jar. Yeah. And I was brought up that even the D word was bad, so I, but, you know, some <laughs> things have changed. Anyway, that being said, I, I was finishing up the master's. He was finishing up med school. The first school I'd heard from was Cornell, and he matched at Syracuse in uh, SUNY Upstate Medical Center. Now, that's about, what, 60 or so miles apart. He's like, oh, great, you can commute. No, you can't, because they closed the highway down, Highway 81, with blizzards. So I was a married lady living on campus with another young woman. <laughs> I had a dorm room. And then I was, you know, when I could get home, I would go back, you know, into Syracuse. We had an apartment there. And recently we took our youngest up on the tour of where we started our lives. And he looked at our apartment building, which is now over 30 years old, and he said, Mom, this looks like an asylum. <laughs> I was like, ha! I'm like, well, it was nice when we got there because they had painted this weird blue. It looked, you know those movies where they have the, the hospital and you see the long hallway? Yes, you know, yes, the, yes. That's the way it looked on the floor. It really did look like, like an escape room asylum. But so we, we escaped in the sense that my husband finished residency, and I said, I'm, I'm, I got all the experiments done. So I actually wrote my dissertation in a month. I just like, <laughs> woo! 
and at that time, yeah, at that t- well, I had all the stuff. You know, you, you do the citations. You do, so you have, all, you just got to put it together, right? So I love that. <laughs> <laughs> Take a sure. moment. That's pause. all you have to Wait, do. Wait, pause right here. And just, I want to repeat that. I'm not trying to be flippant. You just have to put it together. I was... <laughs> I was motivated. I, we actually wanted to live in the same city for once, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so I and that was before before um, uh, what do you call it the personal computer. So I I hand wrote it and gave it to a professional typist. That's what you did then, and she typed it. And I said, "Can you do the equations and stuff?" She goes, I, "Yeah, I've been doing this forever." So they used to turn. This sounds so ancient when I think about it. Believe me, it's not that it's not that far. They would do the carriage return and do the superscripts and all that. So I got it all typed up. I gave my figures to a draftswoman. It was actually one, probably one of the few women that did drafting, and she was great. So she drew all my stuff, and I put it together and and defended. And after my defense, I went back to I w- my lease was up and all that. So I got like the least expensive, but not like killer area, like where you would get killed, motel room. <laughs> And I, I got, I bought some quote unquote Chinese food, you know, if you've been in China, you know, it's not real. And I bought Chinese food and I watched Sesame Street, right, <laughs> after I defended, because that's about all my brain was gonna tell. So like, <laughs> A, B. <laughs> <laughs> so the bottom line, you, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> like, like a typical academic, what was the question? We went on a journey, everybody. <laughs> yeah, we did. So, no. oh, I know. So, yeah. what happened in my last year, I was yeah. looking at what I would do, you know, in terms of job-wise, and I basically figured for the type of work I had done, which was, and this is the fun, if you want to sleep on a plane, I don't want people to bother you, what do you do? Molecular beam epitaxy? <laughs> oh, okay, great, that's in that kind of <laughs> I'm an introvert for real, believe it or not. Myers-Briggs, I test like 95% introvert, but that being said, I figured the work I was doing looked like I would be kind of like a highly paid technician and nothing against, I love technicians because they, they were my lifeblood, you know, summer internships and jobs. But I didn't want to be just tied to this piece of equipment like, okay, we want a bunch of bipolar transistors, you know, grow this material. So I, I said, well, let me, I said, I don't want to grade papers and stuff, eh, you know, but okay, I, I'll check it out. So I interviewed for a couple of academic jobs. I, we, back then in EEs, or engineering, I guess, in general, maybe about a third of the people did postdocs. It wasn't the norm, right? So right. I did not do a postdoc. So I, I was offered a, p- a position at, at Duke. My husband was offered a position with uh, um, an HMO, what, uh, which was um, also in Durham. So that's the first time we actually were able to live in the same house all the time, four wow. years after we were married. <laughs> but that being said, and I'll leave it with this, when I started at Duke, um, you know, I'm, I, just, I, I did a talk recently called title was one of these things is not like the other colon an african-american woman's journey to academia (laughs) because when i went to duke and i was the i was told i was the second ever female they hired for the entire school of engineering not just ee but all of it the first one had you know red flag the first one had left with some very serious like maybe um, congenital disorder or whatever and maybe had passed away i was the only you know person of color really in terms of like if you define african-american you know Hispanic or Latinx, Latinx and so forth. So I was the only black person, I was the only woman. And somebody came to give a talk to the whole college, you know, the faculty, the yearly meeting. And a couple of weeks later, I'm walking across campus, and there was this very tall woman, you know, and we're walking, we come to each other, and she looks at me, and she goes, you! And I was like, like yeah. this is my first year as a professor. She says, I came to your college, and I gave a talk, and I saw all these bald heads and white beards and you in the audience. <laughs> And I'll tell you, I say, yeah, been there, you know, mm -hmm, same thing in my research group, or grad student, same thing going on. But I look at it this way, I can definitely tell you, you know, the horror stories of, you know, uh, when gender and race come into it. I can also tell you, like, I hope to say the survival stories. And goodness knows, I would never have been dressed like this years ago. (laughs) But our our, our oldest son was coming, we were bringing him to see Georgia Tech. And we took the, you know, the weekend, and he says, by the way, Oh, by the way, oh, by the way, you know what's going on? When we saw this block, this block, I was like, what? I said, I'm not staying that line, it's five blocks long. <laughs> we did, and here we are. And so the bottom line is today, I guess, I, I ended up, I said, okay, I can put up with grading papers. And then I found, at, particularly, at, I've gone through enough stuff that I don't want other people to go through some of this stuff. Yeah. So I end up talking to students sometimes long enough where they're like, Dr. Race, we gotta uh, go, we gotta go to class. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but my h- heart set on actually trying to help some folks not go through some of the things which you know, I can tell you offline, or I'll tell you here, I don't care. Mm-hmm. Um, 
and Out in the hallway. This, yeah, this, off this a hot today, mic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think I'm, this is the first time on a panel I've actually put on my you know cosplay my whatever it is stuff, and it's because to now having done the whole you know tenure track and blah 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 and. and getting a call one day literally out of the blue from someone asking, I hear you're thinking of leaving Duke, which I put out a couple of feelers, but nothing like, like who, what? And, and then I said, okay, how many people are named Theta Daniels Race or black or women and do molecular beam epitaxy, I guess. <laughs> and, uh, they kind of figured who out was. So in I got a universe, call. In this universe, just the one. <laughs> At that time. This, this, okay. sure, <laughs> the, yeah, in this universe. But I got a call, blah, 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 I'll, I'll skip ahead, and ended up, um, it wasn't a pay cut, thank goodness, and they had more, I'm an experimentalist, Duke was going more theoretically in that direction, I need stuff. So I took the position at LSU, and um, you know, I always say this with respect for everybody, but I do believe in God because the divine intervention was when my husband and I went down there, he was introduced to some people at the law school who, who were looking for a health law professor. And awesome. so he'd already left medicine. He was doing some legal stuff. He didn't like sitting in a box by himself. He talks a way lot more than me. And, and he did some teaching on the side. He did teaching, and so he, he ended up being a prof. And I, I'm but a this is important that because, you know, what we don't talk about sometimes in our job is that I tell my students is, what's the job that you want for your life? Notice I did not say your job is your life. And it sounds to me like, you made decisions, and we've all made decisions that will. Be, what fits my life? Yes. Not sometimes. Oh yeah, I was the a other way around. Dare right? to have a child at Duke, the yeah. first woman in, the, in all the engineering. <gasps> How dare I? That you know, uh, there's a lot of freak out. Like I, you know, I just didn't look like anybody. I yeah. had children, so yeah. And I know Tori that you've done that because I mean, I don't know, maybe all of you know that, but you probably one of the most hardcore cosplayers I know. Um, and yeah. Yeah, and you know, you cosplay on campus, so like you're bringing your full authentic self, whatever we want to call that, to your job. Um, is that part of the decisions that you've made at different points? Besides, I mean, let's be honest, we have to make financial, the rent's got to be paid. Mm -hmm. Like these are, that's another big thing. And, but is that also part of why you maybe pick a particular job? I don't know if it's why I pick a particular job, but it is definitely a conscious decision. Um, and part of it is some of the things I do. Uh, I did I did put my, uh, if you can find me on Instagram at Tereshkova Costuming if you want to see that. One of the things I do is fabric dyeing, which is organic chemistry. Mm -hmm. So I actually have written a, a couple different variations of a lab experiment for my organic chemistry students, where sometimes I have them synthesize their own fabric dyes. Cool. And also I provide, here's some pre-made ones as well that I just pull out of my stash at home. And I'm like, here, here's some fabric. Dye it. Have fun. And then I, you know, in the, the pre-lab lecture, it's like, okay, here, we'll talk about the chemistry of it. And here's my cosplay portfolio of all the things I've dyed and how I've dyed them. Um, and so it's part of that, yeah, show, show people that it doesn't have to just be this. And show the overlap of, of this. And, you know, in past years, we've done the, the science of cosplay as a panel here. And that's always really fun. Um, yeah. And yeah, and I deal with it a little bit, you know, I try to, you know, to, to, to model what I want my students to see. And so part of it for me is trying to be, um, to be openly queer for my students so that they mm -hmm. can see that, so that they can see mm -hmm. that, yeah, it's, it's okay. This is how you grow up. And, and you know, and, and I don't usually talk about like my personal, personal life, but I'm not shy about being part of that community and, and supporting people and stuff. Cause like, I want them to know who I am as a person. Um, I had a student once come into my office, physically twisted up, just just awkward with his hands all. Duh, duh, duh. So I was at. This is gonna sound really nerdy, but I was at my D and D game last night, and I was thinking about chemistry. And I went, "You play D and D? That's so cool. Tell me about it." And he just un physically untwisted out of that <laughs> knot. We chatted about D and D. I'm like, "Okay, cool. So what were you thinking about chemistry?" And we got back there and stuff, and like that. Man, he is in for a rude awakening when he finds out how many chemists are playing D and D. Oh yeah, oh yeah, all the time. <laughs> like it is a whole thing. Computer science, my kids. Yeah, I mean, there's exactly. actually a D and D game at the ACS, so the American Chemical Society meeting was just in what? Chicago. And what? There is not, and it's I a matter that. of which hotel's D and D game. It's oh these are God. folks that have been playing since grad school. Right, that's it's really a big thing. Now I the other the original box, I'm so so mad. You are next to I the actual like D and 
he, he was running a game last night. Oh, so no, I had the one when they first <laughs> came out, and I spent the summer as a kid trying to figure that book out. <laughs> 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 so was man, no, look, I saved my money. Ty I had ten dollars. It was like ten dollars. Something. You went to the bookstores. I bought this. I was, was it the red this, box? It, it was the book. It was the beautiful box with all this artwork. Yeah. And here's what bugged me about Basic it. Basic set. Yeah. Open the box. There was nothing basically in it. There nope. was like a piece of paper, like a blueprint. <laughs> Spoken and like a, a true book, engineer. And a book. <laughs> and I was like, I just spent my money for a pretty box. Okay, like, hey, this better be. I read the book all summer on the, the summer family trip we take from New Orleans to Houston most time. I had to see Astro in the Science Museum. I read the book on the way back. I had, I, I was like, I just, and then I went back to the bookstore and there was like an encyclopedia set of wall of, you know, this kind of monster and this kind of thing. Yep. And it finally dawned on me, wait a minute. I bought an empty box and I have to pretend I'm somebody? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, thank no. So what you're saying is you're not going to join Trevor's game? Uh, well, I, 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 I wish I still had it because I heard on eBay the originals were going for like 80K. <laughs> And I'm oh, so mad. I, it, I, I went to my parents' house already digging for it, but I can't. If it's the it. small white box, the original chain mail rules, oh. then yeah, that, that goes okay, about 80K. No, if it's the large 8.5 by 11 uh, original 1970, yeah. uh, 70, no, 1981 <laughs> basic set, uh, oh. that's, uh, but in mint condition, that's still going for about mm, 12 to 1600, <laughs> depending on if it has the original three dice. Did you throw this out? Is that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Mm. Okay, I am glad that she's like, no, your honor, I want to, no. Uh, so we have about 10 minutes left, so I think we'll open it up for some audience questions. Please make sure they are, in fact, questions <laughs> and not comments <laughs> with inflections on the end. Test, test, test. Because we all know the difference. All right. Um, one other request, since we have a Is lip reading, um, which way should we have people facing for lip reading? Oh, well, they just said in general, because it, yeah. Disability services, you're not necessarily supposed to identify. I will, I will repeat can, the question. Yeah, How about okay. that? Oh, yeah, we'll repeat the question. Um, whoa. Ooh, okay, <laughs> or not. Hi. Um, being a spouse and watching your spouse go through the hits that are happen over and over, and you can't do anything about it. Uh, I'm, I'm actually asking about this theory that you need to put people through the various hits in order for them to develop ah. and whether you continue that when your people that you are training. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, so I'll, I'll repeat that for lip reading and, I, and I'm gonna just try to paraphrase this, but you know, you go through maybe a gauntlet or hits, There's and they call it training, <laughs> uh, is, you know, do you need to do it at that level, almost a boot camp kind <laughs> of intent? Like, is that really necessary? To, to produce excellence. That's usually the word that gets thrown around. Um, and I would say absolutely not, right? I mean, I think that you can absolutely, as someone who has thankfully and luckily uh, trained chemists, which is the best part of my job, you do not have to be toxic, abusive, and wrap it and call it that you're being rigorous. Um, you, that is BS. <laughs> Baloney sausage, no. Uh, um, the, you can, and I, I keep very specific work hours. The other big kind of almost soft level of abuse, if I say that, is a labor creep. Yeah. And this idea of, well, you're not serious unless you're working 13, 14 hours a day, 80 days a week, because you're not dedicated. No, I'm an analytical chemist. Honey, if you can't get it done between nine and five, it's because you're not efficient. <laughs> get your specifications down, get your house in order, and do what needs to be done, and stop BSing on social media between your lunch hour. Like, you're just not being efficient enough. I don't need to come in on the weekends. I do not expect my students to. I expect them to be efficient during work hours. And that like is what I expect. That's it. And I have to do the training to get them to that level so that we can all make progress and we can do this on a reasonable time scale. And when you go home, I like you. You're great. I don't want to hear from you. <laughs> <laughs> and vice versa. You shouldn't want to hear from me either. So that is something I really work on. But it is so easy to fall into the habits of what you were indoctrinated with because that's what you saw. That's what 
you experience, I mean, I've seen, quote, good people slip in, back into really bad habits because they literally, that's what they know for 30 or 40 years. You have to actively work to not do what was done to you and what mm -hmm. you experienced. I, I can tell you, I had a chairman when I was a new young professor who, bottom line was at one point, I used to have to put a post-it note on my door saying back in 10 minutes when I went to the bathroom <laughs> because this guy is, is way more, that's, that's minimal, let me tell you. <laughs> this was someone who would come down the hall and, and swear that me, not all the people in the hallway, but assume that I was not working if he didn't see me sitting in my chair. Well, I had a lab down the hall that had to go to the library, sometimes I go to the bathroom, and I work with my door closed, because that's the way I am, and I'm a night owl, my students know that, so I, I might be up till dawn working, but I don't expect my students, you know, well, if they want to. So we have texted at 3 and 4 a.m. <laughs> when, they, when, they, when they have a big talk the next day, and they want to, all right? But I'm just saying, that the toxicity of having a boss who, when you, you are at a point, that was just one thing that I have to say back in 10 minutes, because if that was not there and my door was closed, I would get talked to about you're not working hard enough. And I took that, quite frankly, by the time it got to the dean, I said, to me, this is, a, and let me just be blunt, I said, this is a stereotype of what's oftentimes said to, to black people yes. and so forth, of yeah. you're not working hard enough. And uh, maybe offline, I'll tell you what I said. It wasn't bad words, <laughs> but I said something to the effect of bending over, it seemed like, and something was happening to me mm -hmm. on the other end. Um, yeah, so the talk, it, it's, there's definitely super toxic people to their students, and I, 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 I tell, I hope I'm not, as far as I know I'm not. And colleagues, I mean, because your colleagues story is really about. Right, that's the main thing. So in every workplace, like, what, yes, what are we doing colleagues. to best support <laughs> each other, right? And yeah, that, I, was, I was on my own, babe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, mean, I was like, to support me. <laughs> that is, you know, when you feel alone in your workplace, and it's isolating, and it, maybe that's a good thing. I don't know anyone's experience, too, with, for a lot of the downsides maybe of social media and kind of parasocial relationships, for a lot of academics from marginalized communities, that's actually been a way to kind of, what's this kind of support network? Um, so has that played a role in anyone's like kind of professional experiences being able to have those groups? I mean, I know it has for me with like black in chem, hashtag black in STEM, those have been really, really key, but have there been other folks where the that's been helpful? Yeah, I had a, um, I had a really deep conversation with my supervisor when I was leaving my postdoc about this um, because I was the only woman that that group had hired ever. Um, and, uh, and when I told him I was leaving, he basically wanted to know uh, genuinely, like if I had felt supported enough, what they could do because now again, it was all old white men <laughs> in the department now that I left. <laughs> that tattooed heavy metal chick <laughs> just peaced out. <laughs> what are we going to do? But I really, but I respected the fact that he was at least cognizant and the way that he phrased it was, I feel like we are losing a different perspective in our research group by losing you. He's like, I respect your choices and I, I you know, and I want you to go off and do great things, but I want to know how we can become better in this department. And I think just even expressing that helped a lot and that made me because yeah, I they don't usually yeah. do exit interviews in academia they no. usually like here's a cardboard box and, and, <laughs> and I'm still the only yeah. woman in my department but at a oh, at a different university since 2003 um, we had one other woman one year she only stayed one year she was fabulous but she left Georgia Tech you know you're out. so <laughs> this is we're going from basically 1990 where you're the only female and in that case only you know African American in the whole college of engineering then by the time the first female dean came on, at, at Boulder, Dr. Christina Johnson is fabulous, and she's un, she's been undersecretary of the Department of Energy under President Obama. <laughs> she's been she's now the the president of the Ohio State University. She's done all kinds of stuff. Uh, she's over a hundred. You know the movie Avatar? <laughs> that was her work and her patents. So <laughs> she's she's amazing. But when she came as dean to Duke, and she said, "Where are all the women?" She wanted she wanted to meet all the faculty. So she and I went to dinner. I went um. Mm -hmm. I, I said, there, I think there's one in bioengineering, and that was about <laughs> it. She changed that. But then I did change over, now I'm down at LSU, and there are more women in like the um, bioengineering, um, which was kind of associated with the Ag College. Yeah. But EE, we almost had another woman hired, and she had a visa issue. 
but it's hard. I'm I mean, still it. yeah, it is hard to to recruit and retain. But I do want to end on a positive note because yes. we do need an upon us note. Is that you? I hope you've seen that we all got into our fields in very different ways, and we've made some difficult decisions along the way. But I'd like to think that <laughs> people are doing what they generally enjoy, and which is steam. a privilege. We're steam people, really. Yeah, we it's are steam people. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so hopefully we'll see you at our other panels coming up today. What's the next panel everyone's on real quick? Oh, next oh. panel. Uh, okay. I'm doing science writing at four. What else we got? We're talking about Star Trek Strange New Science. Science of Strange New Worlds. Yeah, anything four. else for you at Theta? Uh, I think this is my last one. I was going to do the economics and research, but it's on Monday and I have ah, to fly out. Okay, oh. Trevor, what's your next one? The Paleontology Power Hour in 30 minutes. Awesome. <laughs> Corey, next one. Science versus Movies, Sunday, 10 p.m. Watch yes. us explain yes. why yes. terrible disaster movies are 100% scientifically accurate. Yes. I can't wait for that. Yes. yes. Thank you, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks for joining us. Um, please remember to rate us in the app if you liked what you saw. Please remember to donate to the charity. If you have weird questions you'd like to ask for the 1 p.m. Monday panel of calculations you wish we weren't doing, please submit your questions over here. So something like, how many jello shots can fit in the belly of a blue whale? Otherwise, join us in our next big room panels. Um, as Trevor said, the paleontology hour in half an hour in Hilton Crystal Ballroom. Then at 2.30 in Hilton Grand East, we have machine learning and science. And then at 4 p.m. in Hilton Grand East, we have Star Trek Strange New Science. Thanks for coming. Enjoy your con.